your spirit and we welcome your presence in this place. We lift up a praise to you. Your name is worthy. Let's sing it out.
are blessed tonight. How many of you got your Bibles with you? Got your Bibles with you? Get a piece of paper and a pencil. I don't say this very often. Didn't say it Sunday morning, but I'm just reminded of it. Uh, Brother Mike's ministry is very unique. God uses him in a very unique way. He quotes scriptures one right after the other. So, you know, I would like to tell you, open your Bibles up, but by the time you do that, you miss five scriptures. So I believe if you'll listen with an open heart, with a piece of paper and a pencil, that's your way of getting your heart ready because you're hungry because God has got several verses of scriptures that he's going to kind of quicken in your heart. And, you know, you might not seem like, well, I don't really need them now, but I'm telling you, when God quickens something in your heart and you're kind of like your spiritual ears perk up, how many know what I'm talking about? Write that down. How many know the Holy Ghost knows what you're going to face in the tomorrows? He likes to get us ready. Come on, church. God says, everybody say, God likes to get us ready. So stand up if you would, please, and honor the gift of God tonight, Brother Mike Manuel. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. I get blessed when he leads the service. He's full of the Word of God, excited about Jesus, and that's the way we all ought to be. Christ said in Mark 4, 24, take heed what you hear. That's content. In Luke 8, 18, he said, take heed how you hear. That's attitude. And our attitude will determine our altitude. We need to realize this is the word of the living God. Proverbs 4, 20, my son, attend to my words. Incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. For they are life unto those that find them, and health to all their flesh. Keep thy heart with all diligence. For out of it are the issues of life. When it says keep, in the Hebrew it means protect Watch over. We shouldn't allow the devil to steal God's word out of our heart. Mark 4, 15 records where Jesus said Satan comes next week, next month, next year. No, he comes immediately to take away the word that's sown in their heart. But guess what? He can't take the word unless by default you and I allow him to. You may be seated. Turn back to John chapter 16, verse 33. I want to continue on talking about what's going on, the coming of the Lord, and our response to what we see and know. In John 16, Christ said, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Jesus' victory is our victory. Christ came to liberate you and I from the bondage of sin. We sang about it a few minutes ago. That is one of my favorite songs. Every word of praise, and you all do a great job with it. In fact, I think a few years ago did I mention that? And evidently Eric and Jeannie decided, you know what? We're going to learn that song. Well, you all are singing it very well. Did you sing it last year? So, okay, maybe this is the second year. But I love that song. God's worthy of praise. Well, preacher, I don't feel like it. There are two times to praise God when you feel like it and when you don't feel like it. We need to praise God the most when we feel like praising God the least. Praise will drive depression away, oppression away. God inhabits Psalm 22, 3, the praises of his people. I mentioned back in 2010, I was on a Caribbean cruise. Uh, a lawyer and his wife, Graham and Glenda Martin, he's a judge. He's an attorney over Magotha County, Kentucky, and I always preach in Florida in January. So they invited me to go with them on this Caribbean cruise. And in Jamaica, this Jamaican tried to sell me some wacky weed, marijuana. He said, Mon, do you want to get high, Mon? I said, Mon, I've been high all day. He said, Mon, I can keep you there. I said, you didn't get me here, Mon. You can't keep me here, Mon. He said, what you high on, Mon? I said, it's Jesus, Mon. He said, oh, I know Jesus, Mon. I said, you know Jesus, and you smoked the wacky weed and peddled the dove? You don't know Jesus. You're serving diabolos the devil. He said, keep it down, Mon, because I'm talking louder than him. He said, keep it down. And then he used my terminology. He said, I won't smoke the wacky weed. I won't peddle the dove. And Psalm 68, verse 1 came to me. Let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. Let them also that hate him flee from before him. Praise is a weapon. Acts 16, 25 says that Paul and Silas sang praises to God at the midnight hour. And God sent an earthquake. And they were loosed out of their chains, about to escape to freedom. And back then, if you're a prisoner escaped, that meant your life anyway. And the prisoner, no doubt, was going to commit Harry Carey suicide. And Paul said, sir, do thyself no harm. This man who probably thought a few hours before, I've got some religious kooks locked up in there, he said, what must I do to be saved? And Paul said in Acts 16, 31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. 
Remember the Israelites on the seventh day were told to go around Jericho seven times. They did it once each day for six days. On the seventh day, they went around seven times, and when the priests blew the ram's horns, the walls were pushed down flat. Psalm 149, 6, let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. The Word of God is a sword, Ephesians 6, 17. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That's how we defeat the enemy, by speaking the Word of God from a heart of faith. Christ said, in this world, you're going to have trouble. I had a lady many years ago came down to prayer line and said, Brother Manuel, she said, I'm just tired of dealing with the devil. I, I just I don't want to deal with him anymore. And then I started praying for her dissolution. You don't know what that means is, her decease. And she jumped back and said, Dear God, I don't want to die. I said, Ma'am, you didn't leave me any other options. You said you didn't want to have to deal with the devil. Well, as long as we're in this life, finally she got the point and said, Oh, okay, I understand. I said, Learn how to deal with him. Speak the word of God to him. Stay full of faith. Trust God. Put him under your feet. That's where he belongs. Not on your shoulder. This lady stood up at church and said, The devil's been riding my back all day long. Bless his holy name. Somebody said, Take that saddle off your shoulders. He shouldn't be on your back. You ought to be under your feet. Paul said in Romans 16, 20, And the God of peace shall be Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now, I do believe the coming of the Lord is near. Now, we don't know the day or the hour. Christ said in Mark 13, 32, But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Brother Jerry, a few weeks back, there was a preacher talking to me, and he was trying to tell me that the Lord had already came back. I, he said, uh, Revelation's been fulfilled, and much of Matthew 24 and Luke 21 and Mark 13's been fulfilled. I said, The Lord came back? He said, Yes. And he said, he came back over in the Middle East. I said, here's the problem, brother. In Matthew 24, 23, Jesus said, if they say, lo, here's Christ, lo, he's there, believe it not. In verse 27, as the lightning shines from the east to the west, even so also shall the Son of Man coming be. In other words, you'll be able to see it when he comes back. With the church at his second advent. He said, oh. And he was trying to figure out how to explain that. And he finally said, well, I have to think about this. I said, look, the Lord hasn't came back at his second advent. His feet's going to stand upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. Though we cannot know the exact time Christ is coming back, we should be able to know that it's near. In Luke 21, 28, Jesus said, when you begin to see all these things come to pass, lift up your head because your redemption draws near. There are prophetic signs that have been fulfilled that lets us know we're in the last days. Israel is back in her homeland. In Isaiah 11, 11, God said that I'll set my hand the second time to recover the outcasts of Israel, the dispersed of Judah. And then he said in verse 12, he'll bring uh, the, uh, Judah and Israel back into the homeland the second time. Amos 9, 15 says, I'll plant them in their homeland. They'll not be removed again. Israel was without a homeland for almost 2,000 years until May 14, 1948. When they went back to their promised land and Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 11 and 12 were fulfilled. They were scattered by the first time, and we have a history buff here tonight. They were scattered by the first time in 586 B.C. by a Babylonian monarch named Nebuchadnezzar. He took the Israelites into captivity for 70 years. This was predicted in Jeremiah chapter 25 and verse number 11. In Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse number 10, God said, you'll serve them for 70 years. Well, they came back to their homeland. They were scattered by the second time in 70 A.D. by Titus, a Roman general who plundered and pillaged Jerusalem and scattered the Jews abroad upon the face of the earth. They were without a home. Now, it's a miracle there's even a Jewish people. To have been dispersed for almost 2,000 years and to retain their identity, that's nothing short, Cheryl, of the miraculous. They went back home as fulfilled in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 11 to 12. Jesus said in Luke 21, 24, Jerusalem shall be trodden down to the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Jerusalem was under Gentile, non-Jewish occupation for almost 2,500 years until the June 1967 six-day war when they recaptured the holy city. That lets us know we're at the time of the end. Once again, I don't know when the Lord's coming back. I can't give you a day or an hour, but I do believe that it's 
His coming is near, on the horizon, even at the door. Christ said to Matthew 24, 44, Therefore be also ready for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Back in West Virginia, probably here in Pennsylvania, maybe down in Texas, uh, when young kids are growing up, they would play a game called hide and seek. And one child would be designated it. And it would count out to 50 or 100. All the other children would run and find a place to hide. Then after it had counted out to the designated number, it would say, ready or not, here I come. Now Jesus told us he would come back. In Acts 1.11, the angel said, you men of Galilee, why stand you gazing into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up for you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. He will come back. In John 14, 1, Christ said, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many little old cabins. I could have said that in some churches, no doubt. I would have gotten a hearty amen, brother. Let me make this statement. If Jesus had promised a log cabin, that would be fine with me, but he didn't promise a log cabin. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. He will come back. Hebrews 9, 28, For them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. He came the first time to suffer and die. 1 John 3, 8, For this purpose, this reason, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Paul said in Galatians 4, 4, When the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law. In Luke 19, 10, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He came as a lamb. 1 Peter 1, 20, He was as a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. That's why John the Baptist said in John 1, 29, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. He's coming back the next time as a lion. Hallelujah. He's coming back with the saints. Now, he'll come to receive the saints unto himself. I've got good friends that are amillennialists. Some are mid-tribulation rapturous. We're good friends. This is not essential to salvation to know exactly when and how the Lord will come back. We need to know he's going to come back. But I believe the Bible gives us information that we can know about the return of the Lord. And one fellow, fellow said he was so much of a pre, and I'm pre-tribulation rapturous, he was so much of a pre-tribulation pre -tribulation rapturous, he wouldn't eat any post-toasties. <laughs> That's a cereal, by the way. But I want to take the first train leaving the station. Amen. Now, one fellow said, well, you know, the, the devil's already been chained up. I said, he must have a long chain. Come on, saints of God. During the thousand-year reign of Christ on the earth, there's going to be peace and tranquility. A child will be able to put his hand over the hole of an asper and adder, and the wolf and the lamb will lay down together. There will not be uh, animals chasing to kill animals, carnivorous animals uh, that are killing and eating animals, and we're allowed to eat meat in this dispensation. That was not the plan of God from the beginning, to kill and to eat. We're allowed to do that because of the dispensation we're living in, but that will cease. We're going to eat the leaves of the tree of life, and it's for the healing of the nations, saints of God. Praise God. And I thank God that uh, there won't be animals chasing animals. You know, when I watch some of these um, things on the History Channel or Discovery Channel, it's, it's pretty violent uh, when the lions will chase down a water buffalo or a wildebeest or some, some animals trying to cross a river and here come the crocodiles and the alligators. It is gruesome to say the least. That was not God. Death was not part of God's plan. And by the way, I'm just going to throw this in for good measure. I believe your pets will be in heaven. Go to Romans chapter 8, verses 19 through 23. And it, in essence, says, The creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain, waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. And not only they, but we ourselves also groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. Not only they, but we too. Animals were put under the curse, not because they did anything wrong. It's because Adam and Eve headed up God's creation, and God could not allow a lower form of life to rule over his man and his woman. So that meant that the whole creation was put under a curse. But thank God, Galatians 3.13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. 
But he's coming back the second time. Zechariah 14, 4 says, In that day his feet will stand upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and that mountain will split in two, half toward the east, half toward the west, which will create a great valley. And verse 5 says, The Lord my God cometh, and all of his saints with him. Now, I don't know about you, but I was a Lone Ranger fan, and I'm going to be on a white horse and high old silver. We're going to be wearing white raiment. You know, I've got the white shoes and my white belt on this trip, so I'll be wearing my white shoes at least one night. I've had people say, you know, uh, you like white shoes? I said, I'm just getting ready for the return of the Lord. And I've told people, if you don't like white shoes, here's your answer. Don't buy any. Pat Boone and I will take care of it. See, Pastor, most of these people, they're too young to know who Pat Boone yeah. is. Amen. But we're going to accompany Christ at his second advent. But he's going to come to receive us to himself. And we want to talk some about signs of the rapture of the church. But we need to realize all these things point to the coming of the Lord. And our response ought to be, as he said Luke 21, 28, when you begin to see these things come to pass, lift up your head because your redemption draws near. In John 4, 35, Christ said, Say not ye there yet four months, then cometh harvest. Behold, I send you, lift up your eyes. Look on the fields, they're white to harvest. Jesus said, when you know I'm coming back, it's time to bring the harvest in. He said in Mark 16, 15, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That means everybody needs an opportunity and deserves an opportunity to hear about Jesus. T.L. Osborne wrote something in the book. He titled it, Soul Winning Out Where the Sinners Are. It's been retitled, Soul Winning Out Where the People Are, that everybody should hear the gospel once before anybody's heard it twice. A holy hush at the congregation. Maybe God's calling some of you to be a missionary. I don't know. But the, the world does need to hear about Jesus. I got to go to the Dominican Republic back in October, and I'll tell you what touched me. It was raining in the first part of the Crusades, the first several nights, and it was raining. And people came out. They kept, kept coming out. And I said, you know, back home when somebody stubs their toe, they won't go to church. These people have come out in the poor and dancing and praising the Lord. Hallelujah. Hungry for the Word of God? We need to stay excited about Jesus Christ. Let not let our enthusiasm wane. I told you before the night I became a Christian, well, many Christians came down to the front of the church. Now, the church I was saved in, they didn't believe in shouting or praising God. My natural response was, Donnie, I'm going to throw my hands up and praise God, but they didn't do it there. And I heard people say, it's good to see the newfound zeal of a newfound Christian. What they were trying to intimate or suggest was, after a while, their fervor, that passion, that exuberance, that excitement will wear off. Well, let me tell you, 45 years, 45 almost and a half years, have came and gone. It hasn't worn off, and I'm not going to let it wear off. Psalm 104, 4 says, he'll make his ministers a flame of fire. In Jeremiah 29, Jeremiah said, I've got a fire shut up in my bones. Now, he wasn't talking about Tex-Mex food, burritos, or enchiladas. The, the word of God will set you on fire. In Jeremiah 15, 16, thy words were found, and I did eat them, and thy word was unto me the joy of rejoicing of mine heart, for I am called by your name, the Lord God of hosts. Christ said in Matthew 4, 4, man shall not live by gyro sandwich or Greek salad alone. I put that in there. He said bread, but he could have said that. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. Yeah. Psalm 81, 10 says, open wide your mouth. God said, I'll fill it. These little baby birds, when they're in the nest and they've hatched out of the egg and the mother goes and gets a worm or something to feed them, you know how those little baby birds are doing? Now, guess what's going to happen if those baby birds do this? It's not going to turn out good for the baby bird. Come on, saints of God. <laughs> That's what pastor told us this morning tonight, that we need to be ready to receive the Word of God. Be eager to receive the Word of God. What God says, not what I'm saying, but what God says. Romans 3, 4 says, let God be true, but every man a liar. Years ago, on the streets of Logan, West Virginia, my hometown, this man came up to me, and I knew the church he attended, and that man's a good pastor, they have a good church. He started saying things were totally um, in defiance of the Word of God, in conflict with what the Word says. I mean, he was saying crazy things. And he was just standing there talking. Finally, I said, well, you know, the Bible really says this. I think I quoted him about 25 scriptures, and he looked at me and bristled. He became angry. You know, when people get mad, the truth comes out before they can shut it off. Christ said in Matthew 12, 34, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. My brother Pete was really influenced after I got saved, not because I was going to church or all this, but when I hit my thumb with a hammer, something else came out than what used to come out. I said, well, praise the Lord. He knew something had happened. Come on, saints of God. You hit your thumb with a hammer, and you can uh, hear what's coming out. But anyway... Uh, we, we need to glorify the Lord. We need to witness for Jesus Christ and realize the Lord is coming back for the church. Titus 2.13, looking for that blessed hope 
and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. In fact, Pastor, I gave that minister that verse too, from Titus 2.13. I said, now how does that play? Because he said the Lord already came back. And he, he said, well, I've got, I've got to study this out a little further. I said, well, you probably need to do that. I said, when Jesus said, as the lightning shines from the east unto the west, even so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. That wasn't some secret event that happened 500 years ago or 1,000 years ago. Everybody would have known about it. Revelation 1.8, he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him. Not in some secret chamber. Every eye will see him. Now the Lord is coming back first for the church. Why? We've not been appointed to wrath. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, God's not upon us to wrath, but to attain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Nahum 1, 2 says God takes vengeance on his adversaries, reserves wrath for his enemies. God chastens his children. He'll take you out of the woodshed, but he'll punish the evildoer. But he chastens his children. We've not been appointed unto wrath. Jesus bore our wrath on Calvary's cross. We're not going to have the taste of the wrath of God. In John 3, 36, Christ said, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Notice that Noah, Mrs. Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth and their wives went into the ark. God shut the door, and then seven days later, I think that's significant, the waters began to fall upon the earth from the clouds above, and those subterranean forces of water began to gush forth from underneath the earth's surface. Then when Abraham interceded for his nephew Lot, Lot and his family was in Sodom and Gomorrah, and God actually walked through the land of Mamre, and Abraham said, hey, why don't you, and there was two men, the angels said, come on over here, and I'll have my wife to cook you a roast beef dinner, and I'll show you my hospitality. And they said, no, said, no, no let me show you this kindness. Well, that's when God also revealed to Abraham that Sarah had laughed when God told Abraham that he was going to have a son because she was up in her 90s and he was close to 100. And, and she said, I did. So he said, you did laugh. And they called the name of the child Isaac, which means laughter. How many knows God has a sense of humor? John, I find that every day when I look in the mirror. God does have a, God does have a sense of humor. Well, you can't laugh in church. Why not? Psalm 126, 2, there is our mouth filled with laughter. Proverbs 17, 22, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. The American Medical Association has documented the fact that laughter is therapeutic. When you laugh, you release endorphins into your system, which promotes a sense of well-being and healing. It's sort of the same sensation drug addicts get, but there's a counterindication with drug use. It destroys your brain and your body. But laughing won't destroy your brain or your body. There was a guy that was dying of cancer. And he loved watching the Three Stooges. He just got all the Three Stooges movies he could uh, get. He watched them, and, and they just kept watching. The cancer left his body. Hallelujah. Kathy, after her father died, March the 17th, 1995, was grieving. And I told Kathy in the years before he died and her mother died June of the year 2000, I said, you need to go spend as much time with your parents as you can while you have them. And we had led her dad to the Lord. And uh, Kathy's mother got saved at the church that I pastored him. But anyway, after her, her dad, Frank Marino, died, she was going to the factory. And, I mean, she led the Christian ladies there. And, uh, you know, they'd pray and they would witness and read the Bible during their lunch break and everything. And Kathy still did those things. But some of her friends said, we want the old Kathy back. She you lost her joy. And she said, the old Kathy doesn't want to come back. I want to be with my dad. Kathy started having trouble with her, her legs. She, she was limping. She's having pain in her body. And she went to work one day, and during the lunch break, she went to the bathroom, and God spoke to her emphatically and said, you're acting as though everything that you and your husband told your dad was a lie. I want you to know your father's with me having the time of his life, and neither your dad or myself want you to be sad the rest of your life. And then God gave her Proverbs 17, 20. That set her free. She came home dancing. She didn't have any more pain in her leg, any more pain in her wrist. Come on, saints of God. A merry heart doth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. Uh, people that are depressed and oppressed all the time, I mean, they start having pain in their body because it affects you. 80% of illness and disease is psychosomatic. It starts in the mind and extends out into the body. Proverbs 23, 7, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. That's why we need to focus on Jesus and the Word of God. 
and the joy of the Lord, Nehemiah 8, 10, is our strength. Not just spiritual strength, pastor, physical strength also. It will bring healing to our bodies. The Lord is coming back for his people, number one. In Genesis chapter 19 and verse 22, the angel said, Go in haste, come out thither. We cannot do what we were sent to do till you be gone out of the city. Does that tell you something? Now, Lot, even though, I mean, he was in a compromised position, but Abraham interceded on his behalf, and Lot and his two daughters and his wife, they were leaving Sodom and Gomorrah. And God told him not to look back, but Genesis 19, 26 says, and when she turned to look behind him, she became a pillar of salt. Now, I know Christ said in Matthew 5, 13, to be the salt of the earth, but not literally in ACL. <laughs> she, she looked back. Christ said in Luke 17, 32, remember Lot's wife. What about her? Her heart was back in the city. Luke 9, 62, Jesus told a young man, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. If you're driving down the highway, it's, all, it's good to glance in the rearview mirror to make sure. But if how many of you keep looking in the rearview mirror, what's going to happen? Disaster. Philippians 3, 14, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The Lord is going to come back for his people. Now, when they left, Sodom and Gomorrah, and they went into Zoar, verse 23 of Genesis 19. And in the rising of the sun, they went to Zoar. Then verse 24 says, Then the Lord God rained fire and brimstone upon Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of heaven. Now, we can intercede for our family. We need to be intercessors, saints of God. We need to stand the gap, make up the hedge. Ezekiel twenty two thirty. God said, I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand at the gap before me for the land that I shall not destroy, but I found them. Therefore have I poured out mine indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my own wrath. Because there was no intercessor at that time, judgment had to fall. Nobody's more concerned about your family than you are. You can get the church to pray, intercessor. We all need to pray, but nobody cares more about your family than you do. And we need to intercede and stand in the gap and make up the hedge. Now notice, when they went out of the city, that's when the judgment fell. Many years ago, Pastor, I read this guy is a well-known prophecy writer, and he, and he had a, another friend of his, a well-known prophecy uh, teacher, and they said that the rapture was only revealed to Paul in the New Testament. It was never made known in the Old Testament. I think I found it in at least three places. Zephaniah 2, 3, Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. Isaiah 26, 19, uh, thy dead men with thy dead bodies, with my dead body, will arise. Verse 20, come my people, enter thou into thy chambers, and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself as a word for a little moment, till the indignation be overpassed. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth, for they are their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood, no more cover her slain. And then to me, this one is the kicker. In the Old Testament, Malachi 3.16. Now, this is at the end of the Old Testament. Malachi was the last writer to the Old Testament. There was 400 years before John the Baptist came saying, Repent! The kingdom of heaven's at hand. In Malachi 3.16, They that feared the Lord spake often one to another. And the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, when I make up my jewels, and I'll spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Then shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God, him that serveth him not. We'll return with the Lord, and there'll be people saved during the tribulation period. I've had people say, well, you know, after the rapture, nobody can get saved. No, we have one lifetime to be saved. What about the people that lived uh, at the end of the law going into the grace period? Did they have more? Oh, they had more chance than anybody else. They had one lifetime to get saved. And we read in the book of Revelation, there's a great multitude. In Revelation chapter 7, John sees 144,000 um, virgin males, preachers of the gospel. And in verse 9, he was perplexed and was talking. And finally, the angel told him, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. Come on, saints of God. But we're going to come back with Christ. We're going to rule and reign with Christ. Amen. Revelation 5.10, We are kings and priests and shall reign on the earth with him. Revelation 1.6, He made us kings and priests unto God and the Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. This statement that a lot of religious folk make is not a true statement and it actually it causes a sense of defeat 
I'm just a sinner saved by grace. You have to sin a little bit every day. Now, let me tell you who concocted that idea. His name starts with a D, ends with an L. There are three other letters in between, the devil. Romans 6, 14, sin shall not have dough many and over you. Why? You're not under law, but you're under grace. There's a greater power work within you and I. Romans 8, 2, the spirit of life of Christ Jesus makes us free from the law of sin and death. Thank God for the blood of Jesus, 1 John 1, 7, that cleanses from all sin. Now, if we miss the mark, Christians can sin and miss the mark. We've got an advocate with the Father, 1 John 2, 1, Jesus Christ the righteous. He's there interceding for us. He's able to save them to the uttermost, Hebrews 7, 25. 1 Timothy 2, 5, there's one God and one mediator between God and me and the man Christ Jesus. Christ said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Well, that's been exclusive, preacher. Well, let me say this. There are mathematical certitudes, certainties. Two plus two is four. It's not nine. It's not 12. It's not 15. You can buy some crystals, go to the Himalaya Mountain, shave your head, rub crystals together, and come back 30 years later, and two plus two is not going to be nine, 12, or 15. It's going to be four. Only Christ rose back from the dead. Great people have walked planet Earth. They lived, they died, they stayed dead. Jesus Christ rose back from the dead. That's what differentiates Christianity from other religion. We have a living Savior. He's alive. He changes hearts. He changes lives. He heals sick bodies. He's a present help, Psalm 46.1, in time of trouble. And he's coming back for you and me. But he's coming back for a church that's up and about the Father's business. There's a world that needs Jesus. Now, this idea, well, I'm a little sinner saved by grace. Let me tell you what God says. We are 1 Peter 2, 9. We're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that we should show forth the moans and groans, the gripes and complaints. No, the praises of him who have called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Some people, when they go to church, instead of being like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're like sad, sad sack, bad back, back to bed I go. David said in Psalm 122, 1, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. One day, I was watching the Three Stooges, by the way, and this man walked in the room, got behind the desk, and then about two minutes later, the Three Stooges came in. They were going doing a job interview. And the man said, gentlemen, and the Three Stooges said, where? Where? And I just see God saying, saints, where? Where's a saint? We're washing the blood of the Lamb. We have right standing with God because of Jesus Christ. We are saints of the Most High God. He's coming first for the church. Well, the word rapture is not in the Bible. The word Bible is not in the Bible, but do you believe in the Bible? The event known as the rapture is in the Bible. The word rapio means to snatch up and to take away. Genesis 5, 24, Enoch walked with God. He was not for God took him. Why did God take him? Hebrews eleven five. 5, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death. But before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. You know, Abraham was a friend of God. And because Abraham was a friend of God, now we're friends of God. Well, guess what? Enoch was a friend of God. He walked with the Lord. And I just believe they were walking one day, and God said, you know what? You're close to my house, and your house has come on. Over in Russia, they call men and women, they send out of space cosmonauts. In the United States, we call men and women, we send out of space astronauts. God has a term he designates for those he's going to take in outer space. How many wants to be classified among those known as the was-nots? Enoch walked with God. He was not. <laughs> For God was with him. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 4.13, uh, We saw are not even as others which have no so hope, for we believe that Jesus died and rose again. Even so also, them which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we said to you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain, to the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. I don't like noise in church. The Bible says you've got a half hour of silence in heaven. Enjoy your half hour of silence. That's all you're going to have. Come on. And these people say that they don't like noise. They like noise if it's the kind of noise they want to hear. Come on, saints of God. And the trumpet of God shall sound. I don't know about you, but when he toots, I'm ready to scoop. And the trumpet of God shall sound. The dead in Christ shall rise first. One pastor said he knew his congregation was going up first because they were all dead in Christ. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. <laughs> then we which are alive remain shall be caught together with them in the Lord in the clouds to be with the Lord and will forever be with the Lord. There's the rapture of the church. Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 2, 1, I beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. He's coming for the church. 
Then he'll come back with the church. When do you think it'll be? Look, there's, we're going to go through some sorrows, as I mentioned this morning. In Matthew chapter 24 and verse 3, as he said upon the Mount of Olives, his disciples came to him privately and said, Master, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the age? He began to tell them signs would take place. Verse 4, he said, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And then he said in verse 7, There will be famines. He said, Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, pestilences, earthquakes, and diverse places. And then he said in verse 8, all these are the beginning of sorrow. So, I mean, there's going to be some tumultuous times, upheavals going on. And, and, and listen, we were born for this, Pastor. We were born for this, saints of God, to be a light to those in darkness, to let them know Jesus is a present help, to let them know that Christ is alive. And I believe we're going to see a great influx of people into the kingdom of God. People are going to see their need of Christ. Do you know worldwide there's some good news? Now, nationwide, we've got some bad news, but I, I believe we're beginning to reserve, reverse these trends. Worldwide, back in the late 70s, early 80s, the bad news was worldwide the natural birth rate exceeded the spiritual birth rate. In other words, more people were being born every day than were being born again. Now, today, and I think it's even better than this, for every person today being born, one and a half people are being born again. Now the spiritual birth rate exceeds the natural birth rate. We're making progress. I remember Andy Griffith on the Andy Griffith Show trying to explain the opiate ratio. He was talking about one and a half kids. And he said, Opie, just forget that. He said, Pa, that's a hard thing to forget. You know, to a child of one and a half kids, you know, that, that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty bad. But, but now, in our country, in the United States, of my age, about 58 to 60 percent of people in my age group base right and wrong from the biblical perspective, from the Word of God. But of young people today, I think that is 14 or 15 percent. I think actually it's moving in the right direction, but it was even lower than that. We have to make a concerted effort to reach the young people where they are with the good news of Jesus Christ. The Lord's going to come back for the saints. He's going to come back with the saints. Now, what is all this that's going on in the world? It's the birth pangs of a new age. But it's not going to be the new age some people are expecting. People think, well, John Lennon sang a song, if there's no religion, no heaven, no hell. Let me tell you, with, with no moral restraint, it would be hell on earth. People think, well, if we can just get those Christians out of here, you know, we could have a good time. You know what? When the church is gone, they're going to wish the church was back. Come on, saints of God. It's a hinder of lawlessness that restrains evil. Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 2, 7, Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he that worketh will let till he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Notice, when the hinder of lawlessness is removed, then all of a sudden there's no retardation of sin, iniquity. There's no holding back. And things are beginning to happen. People say, oh, I never thought I'd live to see that. Hey, stay around a little longer. You're going to see things and hear things you never thought or imagined would ever happen. I'm all saints of God. Well, I think I'm just going to go home and hide in the closet. Is that the attitude? God's people are to stand up in the last days. We're in a spiritual warfare. We're not talking about natural warfare. We're in a spiritual warfare. The souls of men and women hang in the balance. And in these times we're living in, it's time to be the people of God in our generation. When you read in the book of Hebrews, it talks about, I call the book of Hebrews God's Hall of Faith. In Cooperstown, New York, you have the Baseball Hall of Fame. In Springfield, Massachusetts, you have the NBA Hall of Fame. In Canton, Ohio, you have the National Football League Hall of Fame. Well, God has a Hall of Faith. And you read Hebrews chapter 11, you'll read about great heroes and heroines, great men and women that served God in their generation, and we read about them now. I believe we can etch in Acts chapter 29. No, there's only 28 chapters. I, listen, I'm talking about in what the book of Acts shows us the church did. We need to get back to biblical belief and living. 
living in the supernatural. A lot of people just wonder, what am I going to do? It seems like everything is falling apart. Make sure your foot's on the rock. Jesus is a rock. David said in Psalm 61, 2, lead me to the rock that's higher than I. Now, in the tribulation period, there's going to be a temple rebuilt. In the tribulation period, first three and a half years is going to be somewhat tranquil. The last three and a half years is going to be a time that the Bible says, and Christ said in Matthew 24, 21. Now, we all go through tribulation. That's general trouble. But there's a specific tribulation that we're promised in Luke 21, 36. Watch and pray that you may be able to escape all these things that shall come to pass. What he talked about in Luke 21, which parallels what he talked about in Matthew 24 and Mark 13. In Matthew 24, 21, then Jesus said, Then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, no nor ever shall be. That's also mentioned in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. The book of Daniel is a good book to read if you're going to read the book of Revelation. It's just a time. And I, Jeremiah 30 and 7. Alas, that gray is date. So that gray is, day is great so that none is like it. It's a time of Jacob's trouble, but he'll be saved out of it. The tribulation is mentioned in Deuteronomy 4.30. In the latter days when you're in tribulation, it says if you will turn to the Lord, it says that God will have mercy and deliver you in the latter time. We're in the latter time. It's been around 2,000 years since Jesus rose from the dead. Remember, we went from the Roman calendar, you know, the Gregorian calendar to the Roman calendar, and there's a discrepancy of about four, or four to seven years. But we know this much. It's been about 2,000 years ago since Jesus walked on the earth. And one day is with the Lord is 1,000 years. 1,000 years is one day, 2 Peter 3, 8, and Psalm 90, and verse 4. So we know this. The man sojourned from the creation of Adam. Now, and I also do Christian apologetics, and, and I do want you all to pray that this debate that was, they were trying to get a date for it this coming fall. They were working to get a date for me to debate a science professor from Yale University. But because of the China COVID-19 virus, that's probably been put off, so pray that it will happen next year. I'm hoping that it will happen next year. That, uh, because the number one reason why young people turn from God to faith, according to the Pew Research poll, is their tight evolution when they go to college. The sad fact of it is all the legitimate bona fide science substantiates creation and totally refutes the theory of evolution. And that's what we have to do. We have to go into the halls of academia. We've got to go to the down and outer and the up and up. And we've got to go to everybody. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, 22, I have become all things to all men that I might by some means save some. Back in 2007, we had our convention with the Full Gospel Fellowship in San Antonio, Texas, and John Hagee spoke on the attitude of fortitude. John Hagee is a good friend of my dear friend Bob Miller. Bob's up in his 80s. They knew each other as young boys and dear preacher friends. And John Hagee was illustrating what it meant to be all things all men. He said this man got on a train, sat across from an attractive lady, struck up a conversation with her, and then later on he said, Ma'am, what kind of men are you attracted to? She said, The Native American culture fascinates me. Jewish men's success catches my eye, but I have a soft spot in my heart for the good old country boy. She said, I didn't get your name. What is it? He said, Geronimo Goldberg, but my friends call me Bubba. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, when Paul said, I become all things to all men, that I might by some means save some, he wasn't saying, I'm going to get drunk with a drunkard to win the drunkard. I'm going to take dope with a doper to win. No. Paul said, I'm going to get on a level where they can understand me. Amen. We have to be able to converse with people and communicate on their level. Thank God for people that are computer literate and they can do the texting and, and the tweeting and all this. And there are great ministries that's reaching people through this medium. I mean, it's sad how narrow-minded people can be. I'm talking about church folk. Back when radio came about, there were preachers railing against the radio. It's of the devil. It's of the devil. It's of the devil. And a few decades after that, when TV came about, the advent of television, some of these same preachers that were railing against the radio were on the radio talking about the television. It's of the devil. It's of the devil. It's of the devil. And there are people today that think, well, Internet ministries and things like that. It's a way of communicating. I even know people that still think the CMA, Christian Motorcycle Association, how are you going to witness to somebody wearing a leather jacket, riding a motorcycle? What? My goodness. <laughs> Daryl Davis is a great friend of mine. He pastors Word of Evangelistic Outreach Church in Hurley, Virginia. And he has a TV program called Rev Up Ministries. And, I mean, he wears a bandana, and he puts his uh, 
leather jacket on, leather pants, and, and, and the intro, he's coming around to Kerr. And, man, and, and I was preaching him a few years back, and we went up to um, a diner there. Hurley's a little small town in southwest Virginia. And he, he put his bandana on everything because he knew the motorcycle people were going to be. He went down there. He went over there, and he was just talking about motorcycles, and he uh, started witnessing. You know, he's won several of those people to the Lord. Now, probably people get put, if I went over to motorcycle uh, riders, dressed up and everything, and going over my Bible, walking over there, probably they're going to turn me off to begin with. Come on, saints of God. I mean, you can have 10 packages uh, with presents in it, and usually, you know which package the person's going to go for, the one that has the prettiest bow and the nice pack. They, the best gift may not be in that package. If you're going fishing, I've been fishing one time in my life. That tells you how much I know about fishing. I know this much. Certain fish will bite at certain times. Certain fish like certain bait. And then if you know what kind of fish you're trying to catch, Donnie, wouldn't it make sense to use the right bait to get that fish? Come on, saints. Christ said in Matthew 4, 19, follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. Well, all you got to do is catch a fish. Jesus will clean them. Don't try to clean the fish. Let him clean them. <laughs> Hallelujah, saints of God. Well, they need to get straightened up and dressed right. Well, uh, sinners, the church door ought to be open for people to come and hear the gospel. Amen? This guy's preached on TV years ago. And he was preaching. He said, now, you ladies like to wear your hair up in a bun. He said, if that's the hairstyle you prefer, go for it. But if you think that draws you closer to God or makes you a stronger Christian, that's not the case. He went on preaching for two or three minutes, and he said, the Lord told me I need to pray for ladies out in TV land that need to be delivered from bondage. <laughs> Come on, say to God. Hallelujah. I told you about when Colonel Sanders got saved and started going to Evangel Church. Dr. Bob Rogers, pastor now, the son of Wayman Rogers, pastor at the time, and they had to work on his language. He had to, but they worked on him. And even after, uh, Bob's dad would preach a message, and Brother Sanders would go up and say, that was a blankety-blank good message. Well, they worked with him. He had 13 white suits. He'd go on mission trips. He had 13 white suits. You know, he really, when he got saved, I mean, he, was, he wanted to know about God. He wanted to know about the Lord. And I heard that there was a little girl that went up, was not not intimidated by it because everybody, Colonel Sanders, and Christians admit later on, they were a little bit, you know, is she going to hear what I have to say? But he wanted to know about God. And this little girl took over and gave him a little track. She wasn't intimidated. He went to the church and he got saved. Gave a lot of money to the church. Sad thing of it is, if you watch the documentary on Colonel Harlan Sanders, they worked, family members and others worked, and they got the franchise from him. And he was a very generous man. You know, he was getting up in age, and they took advantage of him. How many of us that does happen? That does happen. But I tell you what, he promoted the gospel. Well, saints of God, we're living in tiresome, uh, tiresome times, but let me say this. The church is going to wax strong in the last days. We're going to be a light to this generation. Well, but it's so bad now. Well, listen, it was bad in Noah's time. Genesis 6, 5 says, and I'll close on this, Every heart, the imagination of men, was evil continually. Repent of the Lord that he made man. But then God said of Noah, Thee have I found righteous in this generation. God has a remnant. God has a remnant now, and I believe we're going to take the Word of God out, the full power of God's Word, salvation by the blood of Christ, deliverance, healing, prosperity. God's going to channel resources into the church so you and I can be blessed, but so we can promote the gospel. Thank God for people that will bring folk in and take the effort to bring people to the house of God. Appreciate that. That's a blessing.